Sure. Yeah. Well, um, thank you all for, for hopping on today. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of teaching to do or talking to do, uh, but we just uh, wanted to kind of go over a recap of this last uh, Pace for Life trip this past uh, end of May and beginning of June. Uh, it, uh, it was fantastic, and I think it's just good to kind of learn from those experiences and, and share what, what we took away and how we can optimize moving forward. So just put a little something together. Uh, Dr. Temperley is going to be doing his own talk as well about uh, actual procedural optimization um, and, and steps that we can do to make our computers run as smoothly as possible. But uh, this is more, uh, Julius and I did some brainstorming yesterday from our key takeaways and a little bit about specific patients. So we'll hop right into it. Maybe. There we go. So we just shared a little, a few pictures here um, of, the, of the procedures themselves. This is one of the bi that we did. This is the initial venogram uh, followed by, you can see the actual um, LV lead placement here. It looks like a, a bipolar LV was put into place. Um, but I just kind of wanted to demonstrate some of the complexity that we were uh, we handled. You know, these are we did a number of cases here. So as far as our accomplishments, uh, we did six CRTDs. And for those of you who are in the room with us or are familiar, obviously those are fairly comp uh, complicated procedures. So uh, to get six of those done was fantastic. Uh, four dual chamber pacemakers. We actually used uh, bi or uh, bi generator cans for this because we didn't have uh, dual chambers on hand, unfortunately. So we had to do a little bit of uh, finessing by actually taking a bi v, plugging the um, LV port, and utilizing it as a dual chamber, which in some ways is beneficial because you get a little bit more battery life out of it, which is fantastic. Let's keep moving here. Uh, we also did a CRTD box change a lead revision, two ICDs, and then we did two ICDs in Lagos as well. So um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very productive week. We uh, saw two patients in Abuja Clinic in addition to the patients that we saw um, you know, uh, post and preoperatively. Then Julius and Elvis <clears throat> went down to uh, Port Accor with, uh, with Dr. Dafe to address 69 patient clinic. So that was a very busy day for them. And I, I think Julius can kind of speak to that. I don't know if you want to jump into any of that, Jules, or we can just move on and uh, just move on. <laughs> yeah, okay. But you've said it all. You've said it all. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, oh, these are some of the teams, some of the uh, the teaching. Obviously, here's here's Elvis running the, the show right there. You can tell from his green hat. Here's uh, Julius in Port Accor. We've had two programmers running. Uh, obviously, I didn't want to show any patient faces, so we got the back of the head here. But he, trust me, he did see a lot of patients that day, um, as everyone can uh, can testify. So um, we here's some of the time we spent in Lagos. Uh, and then uh, some of the procedures that we did uh, with Dr. Temperley and Dr. Dafe in. Uh, so um, overall experience, I want to go ahead and talk about some of the, the benefits we had here. It was a, it was very uh, we were very impressed with the with the staff. Everyone was very dedicated and we worked a lot of late nights and there was no complaining. Everybody was just ready to uh, to put in, you know, full effort, which was was fantastic to see. Um, obviously, we had very experienced cardiologists with um, that were ready to uh, to train as well as share their own experience. And I think that having someone who is experienced in this field is, is really beneficial because they can um, add some of the knowledge that we don't have uh, coming from overseas, and we can kind of combine our resources and our, and our education. Um, having strong interventional programs have translate to CRM success. Um, just from our experience in Lagos and Abuja, um, having you know th this a lab that's already set up and ready to go, um, especially having a quality fluoro equipment and things like that, uh, really translates to us being able to just roll in and start addressing patients uh, right away. Um, we're not using any kind of like C arms or anything like that. And it's just, it's good to have staff that are ready to support if we have any kind of complexity. Um, there was a good commitment to sterility and safe practices. We'd love to see that. Um, so we, uh, we were very impressed with, you know, the facilities and how, how well, well everything was ran there. So it was, it was great experience for us overall there. And then uh, one of the things that was very impressive is just the collaboration amongst institutions, amongst physicians, um, and the national, and then obviously cooperating with us as international foundations. Um, you don't always see that when you when you go overseas. So it was it was great to 
to have that kind of support where we knew that everybody had each other's backs and we're all trying to do the best we can to serve, um, you know, underserved patients or in, indigent patients that uh, otherwise wouldn't receive therapy if it wasn't for um, these organizations. So we really appreciate that. Overall, so there were some challenges, obviously, and um, that, that comes anytime you're, you're traveling a long distance to cover cases. Um, medicine effectiveness and quality control issues, I think that you know, some of these things can be reviewed. And um, I think that it just needs to be taken into account. And I think we had a little issue with the with our um, local anesthetic, but we quickly audibled to other um, uh, other medicines or other therapies to kind of compensate for the lack of, of local um, programmer availability. Um, we just don't have a lot of programmers, but uh, Pace for Life has worked, and with Julius especially, has worked very hard to get those uh, new Medtronic iPad-based programmers available. Um, and then, obviously, we're working on getting more programmers for St. Jude as well. So as we get that, uh, it'll only be easier to support our patients and support more cases in the region. Um, we did have some... Just a, question on the, just a question on the local anesthetic. Is it a good idea we should be bringing our own? Is that like an issue? Like the patients have to pay for it, do they? We should just um, bring loads of our own, should we? That yeah, so we actually mentioned that's a good point, Joel, and that's one thing that uh, mentioned later is exactly is I think it's not a bad idea, and if we don't use it, we can leave it behind uh, for them to use later, uh, and it'll help only help with cost savings. But if we do need it, you know, we don't have to give so much fentanyl instead um, to have something that works because one of the problems was they didn't seem to be responding to it, but you can't just continue to give it because if it is actually legitimate, we could be causing neurological issues. Um, you know, it, it could be, there could be some, um, you know, not ideal for things for the patient. So I, I agree. I think it's good to make sure that we have it and bring it are you in. Actually, are you actually saying that you used some and it didn't seem to be working? Yes. Yeah. So for the first couple of patients, we thought maybe mm -hmm. they were just a little, you know, just not experiencing the best thing, the best time, uh, because it's, you know, it's, it can be a little, um, strenuous and stressful of a situation anyway, but by the third patient being fairly symptomatic to even light touching of the pocket, uh, we started to determine there may be something going on with the, with the local. So yeah. quickly, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a physician, uh, Dr. Dafe, you can kind of maybe shed some light on what we did instead. I think it was a fentanyl or um, Tara, you were there as well. So I don't know if anyone wants to talk about the yeah, cocktail yeah. we ended up using. Was it proof? Yeah, we're using the Dazlam and fentanyl it doesn't, yeah. instead. Okay. Okay. When? Okay. And there's and a question. Where I had to use propofol a couple of times as well. Yeah. I had to get an anesthetist. So anesthetist. Yeah. But but for a future mission, would you take just bupivacaine with adrenaline, or would you want fentanyl and uh, midazolam? That's obviously a bit more difficult to transfer. You'd want all of that, really. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we use the bupivacaine um, and lidocaine at Northampton. Yeah. So it would probably be better. I think it's it depends what what we can carry over if we're going to run into issues at uh, at customs and things like that then that may be a limiting yeah. factor but some some drugs I, fentanyl might be a little harder <clears throat> to carry over is my one concern. Yeah. Can I, I make some comments, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, very good. Uh, thank you very much for bringing up the issue of the local. Um, there are many issues, uh, like I told uh, Dr. Timpley when this uh, matter of the uh, local anesthetic came up, um, I said that there are uh, many issues why uh, some of these locals uh, behaves the way they behave. Uh, one is that um, um, studies have shown in our environment that the temperature we have here uh, do really affects our medications, that the optimization of the medications that you have in um, in temperate region, in low temperature region, when you come to the tropical region where the temperature is always high through the uh, through the year, um, the effect of those medication is not as uh, optimal as it is in the uh, in the temperate regions. There have been several documentations on all this. That is one. Then two, um, we know that. Um, uh, this is a developing country and um, the issue of uh, uh, fake drugs uh, over uh, uh, entering into the system is very high uh, because uh, the authorities don't really uh, push or monitor them effectively. 
and uh, you can get uh, parallel drugs or drugs that is, um, are suboptimal and uh, something is written, maybe a paracetamol, uh, one, uh, 500 milligram in a tablet. But when you actually go to the chemistry lab to go and check what is actually in that dose of that drug, it may be maybe uh, 350 or 400 uh, milligram. So, but what is written is 500. So these are all the issues that affect the uh, the um, uh, the issue of a drug here. So, uh, like when that matter came up, uh, the first patient we had uh, during the uh, that was the first day I remember we did uh, three C, uh, three CROTD. Now the first patient we didn't have much problem, and uh, then uh, we also noticed that in our African patient when you give them a midazolam, they usually react, they usually become hyper, they react very funny to the, uh, to the drug. But that is why when I, uh, because of that, when I give, when, I, when, when I'm doing CROT, if I give uh, the local, I don't, use, I don't traditionally use midazolam, but we get the, the anesthetist at the corner so that if there is any need to escalate, the anesthetic comes and take over while your procedure runs smooth for you. So that has been the strategy that we use here. So mm -hmm. when we took the first case, we didn't have much problem. The second case, no much problem. When we started seeing the issue of this local and uh, this thing, even there was one or two cases where we have to not get in the anesthetist to come and uh, uh, ask, I mean, sleep of the patient uh, for this uh, issue of um, patients having pain, and the rest of them. So there are varieties of issues that affect uh, um, the, the, the dosing of these drugs. As AJ rightly said, um, when you give the, the right, um, uh, what, whatever they prescribe uh, dosing, if the patient is not responding, you cannot go further because you feel that you have given the right dose and um, if you go for that, your heart will not allow you to do that. Your conscience and your practice of mercy will not allow you to do that as a medical doctor. So the next thing you have to do is to uh, scale the matter to the uh, to the anesthetic, uh, the anesthetist uh, to take over, and you allow your procedure to go smooth. So this was how we run the program for the remaining cases that were having this issue of the local. So it's something that do occur from time to time, even in the cat lab. Yeah. Not just only that, when you give local for maybe for your angel uh, for access, it's similar thing that you also experience here. So uh, as uh, Dr. Jewel suggested, if we come with some sample from the UK, uh, we can test those sample and see their response against our local here, then that would be a, um, that would be a background for us to say, okay, for future mission, when you are coming, get some local. But for the issue of propofol, I will say no because of the issue with the custom, so that they don't go and pick up something under their scanner and start searching you more than what's supposed to search. A propofol, for you to use propofol, the anesthetist has to be available on the ground and it has, it has to be the work of the anesthetist, not the cardiologist or the surgeons to prescribe it in the absence of the anesthetist. Our propofol, we have never had any issue with it. Uh, fentanyl, we have never had that issue with it on the doses that the anesthetist use. So once we escalate to that point, we call the anesthetist and they took over that and we just continue with that procedure and end it there. I, I really appreciate that. That's fantastic. Uh, one question. So uh, you mentioned the temperature. Are you saying the temperature that the drugs are kept at, or is it to do with the patient themselves? Um, when you're talking about temperature interference. Dr. Daffy? Um, yes, the temperature that the patient makes down. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you now. Yes. So what what did what did uh, studies say is that the temperature we have here makes the drug ineffective. It reduces the potency of the drugs compared to what is being used in the temperate region. 
Uh, when I told Dr. Timpley, what he said is that, uh, what about if we keep them in the cold chain? So uh, in the, uh, that is, he said that what of the lab that is cold? I said, no, that the lab is cold doesn't mean that the drugs are cold. Before the drugs get to that lab, yeah. they are passed uh, pass through the pharmacy, through storage and other things where the temperature are very high and gotcha. that reduce the potency of the drug. So by the time they get to the, uh, to the cat lab where you put them in the fridge, mm. they may actually uh, behave as a, a reduced potency because they are passed through that high temperature uh, in the process of passing through many uh, shin to get to the uh, cat lab. That was how I answered the question to him. Gotcha, no, that makes total sense. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Jalen said in Kenya, they use 20 mil of 2% lidocaine in Northampton. They use 10, uh, of 1% just for reference to everyone. Um, he mentioned that the tougher skin can also affect, um, you know, making the pocket. So yes, who else here? Um, then the other thing, AJ, yes, AJ, sir, the other thing that we also do here is that when we notice that the patient doesn't react only doesn't do well only to uh, lidocaine, we combine it with, we mix lidocaine with bupuvacaine uh, uh -huh. and, um, and the normal cell, and that is tumescent anesthesia. The way we mix the tumescent anesthesia is uh, we give uh, 15 mil, the way we measure it, 15 mil of uh, lidocaine, 10 mm. mil of bupuvacaine, five mil of uh, normal saline. We mix it together. And mm. when we do that, it's more effective than giving only the lido the lidocaine that is another experience we also have here okay yeah dr yeah. chigozi asked about 7.5 mil lidocaine 7.5 mil bupicane but you're actually doing a higher lidocaine you said 15 to 10 correct yeah 15 to 10 to 15 5 to 10. you missed three things okay 15 10 5 okay mm. perfect all right um oh, let me get back here let me close out the chat um so we talked about medicine, program availability, uh, supply. So we had some supply shortage issues. And I think part of this is, you know, obviously it comes with, we can only carry over so much. And I think that in future, um, in future trips, we'll be able to carry over more and send more ahead of time. But we did have a shortage of, of accessories. So uh, port plugs, especially, we ended up having to sacrifice some bipolar leads to plug ports so that we could use uh, bi -V cans as dual chambers. Uh, I think we also did that with one of our uh, maybe one of the CRTs as well to make a to make a dual chamber ICD. Um, we didn't have any dual chamber pacers, obviously. Uh, it, caps are also nice to have. So instead of um, cutting off the lead and tying off the the insulation, it's nice just to have a simple cap to cover anything that we have clipped or any kind of abandoned leads. Uh, we had a shortage of PSA cables as well. So uh, as you can see later, we had to do some adaptation with our PSA cables. Um, Stuart and I did a little bit of uh, wiring, but it worked out pretty well. Um, leads, so we had a shortage of leads on hand as well for specifically for Brady. We had no shortage of uh, LV or the high voltage leads, but the cheaper leads we didn't have a lot of. So um, we had to kind of adjust our strategies and we'll talk about this later, but in some cases where you only have shorter leads or you have more short leads and you have long leads um, and you have a list of patients, it's always recommended to maybe try the shorter 52 centimeter, for example, in the RV. And if it's too short, adapt that to the A. Um, so it's a way to kind of um, to preserve any of your longer leads you may have. We had a we found a passive fixation 60 on the shelf. And by our last case, if that 52 did not fit in the RV and we had to just put it in the RA, we would have had to use an 85 uh, CM RV lead, which is a lot of extra uh, pocket bulk. So uh, I think next time, obviously, we'll try to have some more Brady leads on hand and ready to go. Uh, once again, we mentioned dual chamber pacemakers, um, external defibrillator. There, there was not an external defibrillator in recovery. So at one point, when a patient started to code, they had to grab the defibrillator out of the room we were doing the procedure in, which was also our main source of EKG, and run it out to uh, to obviously give therapy to the patient who was coding on the table. But that kind of leaves us blind in the room. So I think just proliferating external defibrillators, especially in holding um, and higher risk areas is going to be important. And I think that that's something that, that Joel, you've obviously been working on. We brought one over with us this past trip and we're gonna to continue to acquire those devices and, and get them widely available. 
Yeah, just, yeah, okay. just in response to that, we have two more defibrillators in the back cave. We have, I think, a load of PSA cables as well. We just yeah. didn't bring them because we didn't think it'd be useful. And we've got an absolute pile of leads. So again, when Pesh goes out to his next mission, we come back out again. We just, I think we need to get more variety out there or even send a shipment. So there's a bit of a supply, don't we? Yeah. That in addition, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joya, the yeah. you know you sent two defibrillators uh, uh, to me, one in Abuja, one in Portacos. So the one that is in uh, in Abuja, one of the battery, uh, I showed it to uh, to Julius. One of the battery had some issue, but you can put you can plug it and it's still working. So that is what. Uh, after the mission, we noticed that because uh, during uh, the mission, one of the patients that we did earlier on had multiple uh, VT. So AJ, Julius, they have to move out to attend to that patient while uh, Timpley and I were on a procedure. So what we did after the procedure was to move that, def what the defibrillator you sent to Abuja to move that into the recovery room. So currently that defibrillator is stationed in the recovery room in addition to the studies that we are using it for. Okay, so we need to send you more defibrillators. Yes, sir. And yes, do you sir. need more pads? Do you have good access yes. to pads? Because we only yes. sent you no. a fixed number of those. No. But is that a problem? We don't have access. Yeah, we don't have access yep. to pads because all the defibrillators, they use uh, uh, pads. They are not um, a Philip defibrillator. They are, they are not paddles. There's no paddles that can be uh, stationed permanently is part so we need um, uh, parts as uh, AJ uh, pointed out we have some here but I'm sure when those expired when those uh, exhaust, as, as exhausted we may need more to uh, to get on they use they use a lot of the conductive gels Joe um so that's what we use to defibrillate that patient um so they don't have for instance like if we're doing an ICD implant for a patient whether primary prevention or secondary prevention, so we would have a pad on um, in case anything. So they, they can't afford to do that. They can't afford to do that. Yes. That I just couldn't correct. find any paddles. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking for paddles to send and literally they're so old that you can't find them in the UK at the moment, but I'll no. keep looking. Yeah. yeah, pad will be fine, sir. It's pad will be very beautiful. Yes, sir. So the one thing we mentioned too, uh, EKG quality. So um, there seems to be a little bit of noise on the EKG in the room. And I think that may be just a result of having all this equipment that may not be fully insulated. Um, we see this all the time in the US as well, is if there's not an insulated plug that can cause noise, both on the device when you're interrogating it with the programmer, it can also cause noise on the EKGs. So um, just making sure we have a quality EKG system. But the real reason I would say is um, the 12 leads. So I think we had a good way of doing 12 leads, but the systems weren't very good at doing like a live um, a live 12 lead where we could optimize. It took, it liked to do a, a like a screenshot that would take about two minutes to take a picture and then you get the 12 lead pushed out. But unfortunately, uh, when you're trying to optimize LVRV offsets and all these different variables for biventricular pacing, it's good to have just a live EKG that you can pause and freeze. So recording systems obviously would be useful. And then down the road, as we work on uh, getting electrophysiology, like EP ablations, um, recording systems are obviously necessary. So um, working on that, I think would be would be helpful both in holding, but also in the room. Um, Patient prep and turnover, as Dr. Daffe mentioned, I think that um, we saw patient prep and turnover a little slow for the first couple cases, and then we saw an immediate speed up over the following days. And I think that's just a volume thing, right? You don't do a certain procedure uh, very often, and it takes a little bit of time to get that down. But then once we were doing, once we were rolling, the, the turnover was incredibly fast. Um, so I would say for future um, future trips to other locations, uh, I would just trying to prep the patient for the next case while we're still in the previous case um, is usually, it's more conducive towards a quicker turnover and getting five plus cases done in a day, um, which we were doing by the second day. So um, just as just a note, uh, power cuts and generator delay, these are just complaints, it, it worked out fine. Um, we, they have a, a backup electrical system for both the programmer and the light. 
So we would only really lose the room lights when the power went down. But that's just something to be aware of when you're when you're traveling. And I would say if you don't have a system as robust as they had at CardioCare um, or FCC that has backups in case the power goes out, be ready. Because if you don't have batteries in your PSA and that patient is dependent on pacing, you're going to have a bad time. So um, make sure you have your backup batteries and your PSA ready to go just in case we lose, you know, full power to the uh, to the system. But that was never an issue for us because of the what they had in place. Uh, disposable quality. Honestly, disposables are good. Uh, drapes were fine. The one problem was the gowns uh, didn't seem to be um, well constructed to, to maintain sterility of the back. So we had to do a lot of taping and just being aware mm -hmm. Uh, that you have a unsterile back, so you don't walk backwards into the table, or you don't walk backwards into one of the other physicians, and now they're no longer sterile. Um, you know, making sure when you cross each other in that tight corridor that you're crossing back to back, um, and just being aware of the challenges. It would be nice if we could bring some some better uh, gowns for these more uh, sterility. You know, in a cath lab is different from sterility in an EP lab, and since we're leaving something in the body. We definitely don't want an infection. So anything we can do to uh, to optimize that um, and bringing. So we bought we bought all the uh, drapes, didn't we? Specially, but is is that your normal drapes, Emmanuel, or did we use something special? Yes, very good. That the question is raised. Um, the uh, Pace for Life bought all the drapes that we use uh, for the missions. Um, those drapes are the normal drapes that as uh, surgical drapes that are being shifted to uh, to Nigeria so we are not in position to uh, to change me to control that because uh, even those drapes are not manufactured in Nigeria I think they are in their manufacturers in India or in um, um, uh, Thailand and they shift them or China they shift them straight to uh, to the country so we just buy them and use them the way we met them, the way they are. So very important uh, point to raise, sir. Hello, sir. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Hello. Uh, Dr. Daffy on that. Um, yeah, no, so I think the drapes themselves were great. The only thing yeah. that really was concerning, like I said, were, were the gowns, but I think we definitely, we figured that out, but I think it's just something to be aware. I'm not sure the gowns, we didn't source those. Those were from, uh, those were local, correct? Did we bring those yes, over? The, the gowns, uh, AJ, can you hear me? The gowns and the drapes are all, uh, are all sourced, uh, bought here locally. Uh, it's um, space for life, pay for them and uh, the hospital bought them locally. So <clears throat> the local source of these uh, drapes, even though we buy them locally, they are not even manufactured in Nigeria. They are manufactured yeah. outside Nigeria, like India or China or um, Thailand, and they uh, ship them uh, to Nigeria for sales. So this is where we get them from, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could, I we, we, can I just add? We took a few gowns from Northampton that were donated, and like just just a just a handful that we took, which is why it was really tight. They were all large sizes, mm -hmm. so which is why it was quite tight to fit around. You know, JT and also Doctor Daffy at times we were having various sizes. But yeah, it it would be definitely um, good to in the future for any future missions to take gowns as well. I think that would be a really really good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Then the other thing I, I still want to say is uh, the sizes of the gown. And maybe if we are even buying locally, is for us to request for uh, extra large. Extra that large. is the surgical gown. Yeah. So because the guns you pay for surgical yeah. gowns and the supplier just gave you maybe medium or small size, when you are wearing it, you will have issue at the back. So, but if you uh, give instruction to the supplier that please supply me um, uh, extra large, extra, extra large and medium, and it mix them up for you, you will be able to sort out this issue that, uh, um, uh, that uh, doc, um, uh, Mr. AJ just raised about the back of the surgical gun. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, we need to work on that 
for future mission. Even though we are getting them locally, we have to give that instruction that to the supplier that they have to give various sizes of the guns so that we know who is coming and what size is that person uh, where that fits that person appropriately. Okay. Uh, so we, I mentioned the PSA cable. Um, so here's the PSA, they had a re-sterilizable one in Lagos. Uh, we had a re-sterilizable one as well in, um, in Abuja, but we had a ton of these Biotronic and you can actually see the Biotronic plug here that was cut off. Uh, but unfortunately, those don't fit directly into a Abbott or Medtronic PSA. So we had to do a little bit of wiring and then we actually made a, um, a permanent one as well that uh, we left it in Legos for them to use if they do come across any more of these blue biotronic cables. Uh, they definitely function. It's just um, you have to you have to just do uh, white to white and brown to brown wires, tape it together, and it, it works, but it's just things to be aware of uh, when you have shortages. And then there's always the re-sterilizable option, but I think that you know fresh PSA cables are ideal um, if you can do it. Yeah, um, it Sorry, AJ, sorry, this matter you raised. Yeah, um, ordinarily during implants in uh, Nigeria, uh, we usually use, uh, not just only Nigeria, the sub saharan Africa. Because when you say Nigeria, you are talking about uh, West African sub-region, mm -hmm. uh, Ghana, mm -hmm. then you go to uh, Central and um, East Africa. In East Africa, you have Kenya, you have uh, Rwanda, <clears throat> Uganda. So most of the, uh, the PSA cable that we use here are re-sterilizable because uh, Metronic has very, because uh, dominant company here that does the local supply of pacemakers and the uh, cardiac devices are Metronic. Mm -hmm. So they don't have mm -hmm. enough uh, PSA cable for every uh, center. Then two, if you, add the charges of every every new case you want to use a fresh PSA cable even the patient has not been able to buy the uh, the pacemaker uh, then you want to add another charge to it that is before we knew um, uh, pace for life so when pace for life came in the issue of PSA cable has actually improved dramatically here for example uh, now we have an adap uh, adapter where we can plug it to either uh, the Metroni programmer or the Senju programmer, then be able to connect the PSA cable to that uh, uh, adapter. It is the first time we are using it uh, in Nigeria is, uh, is when um, uh, Julius visited last year. And uh, when you now came, that was where all these things not start flowing in the in this part of the world then uh, the other thing so which also show that there have been tremendous improvements on the psa cable by the uh, by the uh, coming of uh, of peace for life um, uh, trying to i um, mean helping indigent uh, people then the other issue is um, the issue of the programmer um, programmer that we usually use here are the old uh, programmer and um, we have not uh, had any knowledge or um, seen or use the new iPad for the first time in, uh, in history. Uh, Jalan, uh, Jalian, uh, Mohamed, uh, Mo Jalian is here. He is from Kenya, he is in, uh, he's in the group. He can also testify to it. Um, there is not nowhere in the sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, especially the uh, West African sub-region, where we have this uh, um, this um, uh, Metronic iPad uh, uh, smart, smart link. Yeah. Yes, smart thing. And so this is the first time in history of this part of the world that um, a Pace for Life made it available to us free that we now have two smart, uh, uh, smart sync, a uh, smart set, uh, a Metronic iPad to interrogate our devices. That is extremely overwhelming for all of us. One is kept for Abuja, Port Harcourt, Aziz, uh, then the other one is kept for Lagos, uh, Aziz. So mm -hmm. it's a great achievement and a great knowledge transfer 
because this is the first time we are using it in this part of the world. So we must make a very um, significant comment on that. And we are really excited to get all this uh, knowledge transfer that. So it's not just that um, Pace for Life is caring for indigent patients, but also transferring knowledge from the developed to the underdeveloping or uh, developing country. That must be very, very important. So that knowledge transfer is what I, I, I really appreciate it apart from caring for the patient freely. The knowledge transfer is, dra is dramatic. Our procedure and our timing of procedure has improved dramatically compared to before because of what Pace for Life has done. Then another thing again is that we, uh, the, the, we had 69, 70 patients that uh, we interrogated in Port Harcourt just only one day. That have never happened in our history here. The reason why that was achieved was one, uh, uh, AJ, Julius, Jared, and other cardiac physiologists have been inter interacting with us on, um, on uh, WhatsApp call to interrogate all these patients. So the problem that we had, they have sorted it out before now. So having that number one day make it easy because most of the patients, they have no problem. I remember uh, Julius uh, interrogated about five St. Jude uh, uh, devices among the 6970. It's five of them were St. Jude. And uh, out of the five St. Jude, there are two I, uh, CROT St. Jude. And he had no pr problem because AJ has already uh, has already programmed those devices. And when he looked at them, he had no issue, uh, no, uh, no problem in the alert, everything is fine. And we just have to leave it and move on to the next. And the same thing with the Medtronic ICD, CROT and pacemaker. So the reason why this was done because of the Pace for Life initiative, that must not be taken for granted. Then I remember last year when, uh, when Julius came, he, it, was, it took him time to interrogate one patient. The reason being that that was the first time he's seen most of those patients mm -hmm. and he has never had any interrogation with those patients. Mm -hmm. And another issue that was raised then was um, some of the interrogation that we usually have locally were not sufficient mm -hmm. to keep those devices running optimally. So we have benefited, not just only the patient. When a device is uh, is correctly programmed, the physician who implanted that device gladdens the heart of that physician. Then also the patient also go home rejoicing. So these are the things that we must speak volume of. So AJ, continue. No, I, I think that's, that's a really good point about the, you know, the, the skills transfer part of this is that, you know, there's already a strong base knowledge in these programs with Dr. Idafe, Dr. Incarno, Dr. Odameji, um, and the staff there as well. But I think that having the extra support um, for complex procedures just makes it, you know, it, it just extends this beyond just a simple one patient impact, but it's an ongoing thing. And then these are the skills that you then pass on to your, um, to the up and coming cardiologists as well that want to implant. Um, as Joel said, it's that, that hub and spoke, um, you know, method of you, you create a center for education and that center educates everyone else. And then we can help and focus on other programs that are, that are not so easy to access. So I, I I'm sorry, AJ, can I add to what um, Dr. Daffy was saying about the smart sink as well? So this might be of interest to Mo Jillian. So what, what the smart sink also does, Mo, is that it allows, allows to do, I remember you were saying that for, um, sometimes you guys struggle with troubleshooting some Medtronic devices. So what, what that will allow is it will allow us to actually zoom in. You can use Zoom on the smart sink. So we can do that from the UK side and actually screen share and see exactly what you're doing. So that, that's absolutely fantastic. So you don't have to use your WhatsApp video anymore with, with Smart Sync. We can zoom in on the tablet PC and actually see exactly what you're seeing. 
interrogating the device. And uh, so that that's a game changer as well. The smart set is also compatible with most, I think, all tacky de Medtronic devices, most of their CRTPs and, and the newer um, pacemakers. Um, and, that, and they are actually um, in line to update um, with some of, I think, most of their old pacemakers as well. Um, so that's um, that's the likes of Sphera. Um, and that, so they will all be by 2025, I think most of their old Medtronic devices, um, pacemakers will all be like compatible with that. So you'll be able to interrogate them with, with um, your SmartSync programmer. You can also use it for doing um, 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 pacing system analyzer as well. So um, use as a pacing system analyzer as well as um, doing your programming interrogation, uh, device interrogation and things like that. So. Yeah, that's sorry, sorry, AJ, carry on. No, no, that's, I, I didn't know about the Zoom aspect. That's that's fantastic. Um, and then for the Avid programmers, just just WhatsApp me in and I'm happy to help with those. Um, but no, that's that's amazing. Um, so yeah, opportunities for uh, improvement. We just got ahead and wrote some of this stuff out. Um, I think, like I said, there's a lot of strong aspects here, but I just wanted to kind of bring some up. So uh, accessories, we need to, you know, proliferate more accessories across these different labs. PSA cables, port plugs, lead caps. Um, I also like to have suture sleeves and um, medical adhesive because it's a good way to repair a damaged lead without having to revise the lead itself. So I usually always keep something like that on hand, which I know we didn't have. Um, for box changes, sometimes you'll see lead to lead abrasion and rather than having to replace a lead, um, if it's not causing any kind of functional issues, you can um, cover that up with a with medical adhesive and a suture sleeve, suture it down, and uh, it's it's a in the field lead repair kit basically. Uh, additional access sheaths, we had to kind of prioritize our access sheaths that we used, um, and then I know that we we had everything we needed, but I think it's always good to make sure we don't run out uh, for future. So um, CRT tools. So I know that in talking with uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Cardo and um, um, in, in Lego, so that's CC, they could really use additional LV lead sheaths, uh, catheters, wires, things like that, LV lead, um, tools, just because it's, you know, it can be a difficult procedure. And some of those, when you're first starting out can, can be a number of hours and you may end up going through multiple wires or you say a difficult anatomy, you could burn through many wires. So, um, just helping, helping programs to have these on hand is, is very helpful. Um, uh, equipment, defibrillator pads, we kind of talked about that. EKG machines, uh, sterile gowns, tables. We're kind of reiterating some things here. Uh, documentation, patient data tracking. I think it's helpful um, to have a more robust system of patient data tracking. I've talked to Dr. Johnson about this, and I know Dr. Dafe and I have talked about this as well as we're working to get a system up and running where we can keep track of our patients, what devices they have, and um, history, things like that, so that when we're in clinic and we see something odd, we can see if this is a new presentation or an ongoing issue. In the meantime, uh, we kind of showed some of the people like Elvis um, and uh, the other, uh, the other uh, cardiac physiologists on how to leave uh, notes within a device. And I always recommend, I'm not sure as much for Medtronic because I'm not experienced programming it, but with Abbott devices, you can leave very specific notes about the patient. Uh, so in those cases, if you see something, I would say, leave it in the device. So the person who interrogates it next will know what's going on without having to try to dig through paperwork that may not exist. Uh, pre and post implant EKGs. It's always nice to see. Um, we had all the pre uh, implant EKGs, but for our CRTDs, I think it's always good practice to do a post uh, EKG as well. So we can do a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so implantable devices, CRT, we had to use some CRTs as pacemakers. Um, we actually had a bunch of CRTDs that we've decided is probably 59% battery. It's only about two or three years in a CRTD, but in a single chamber ICD, that could be five or more, five, eight years. So there's always an opportunity if you have the ability to plug it, is to convert these over uh, to a single chamber. Lead link strategies, as we had kind of talked about in the call or earlier in the call, um, trying a shorter lead in the RV first, if you have a ton of short leads, um, and then adapting it to the atrium if that doesn't work. Works with Brady leads, not obviously with defib leads, but uh, that can help. Um, so things to keep in mind there. Um, then 
we had talked, I talked to Dr. Ijoma and we'd kind of briefly discussed this, Dr. Dafe. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think we're most valuable for these complex procedures because you're more than capable of doing all the dual chamber ICDs and pacemakers in the world and getting CRTs as well, obviously, but I think it's, it's helpful to get guidance from um, seasoned CRT and planners. And that's probably the best use of our time. Um, I would say. So uh, we got a bunch done this past trip and for future trips, there may be an opportunity to split consultants between facilities. If we don't have enough CRTs available to maybe bring the entire team with staff um, from the from that hospital to another hospital to do their CRT population, maybe five or so, and then move to the next hospital. Um, to address their patients needing a CRT. That would allow, if you have two consultants to train, one to actually do the procedure and train a physician and the other one in the control room or in the room explaining uh, in more detail to physicians that are observing and we get the most repetition, uh, most volume out of these complex cases because that's really where we're most helpful in these established uh, programs that know how to do devices already. Um, obviously, if we're going somewhere that hasn't done devices, this is a different conversation. Um, and then consistent programming guidelines. Julius and I are kind of working on this, but uh, maybe getting together like a laminated sheet with like Brady settings for a basic programming. Um, obviously, this is not going to be prescriptive. This would be something that is just a, a guide and you want to use your best judgment there. But um, just having the ability to see you know, what may be a optimal solution for the average patient, and then you can always change it uh, and optimize it for that specific patient. But walking through Brady, walking through Tacky, because Tacky is obviously complicated. And then I left a couple things with you, uh, Dr. Dafe and Elvis on CRT optimization. So those little flip books that kind of explain how to do that for Abbott, and we can put something together for um, Medtronic as well. Uh, this patient here, uh, Let's see, I just want to jump right in. Uh, this was a Medtronic CRTD. Um, this one was kind of interesting because if you look at how it was registered for the QRS duration, 236 milliseconds, actually measuring it out, it's probably a little closer to 200. And you see here that it's mismeasuring or misattributing what could be a P wave to uh, part of the QRS and adding that to the QRS duration. And then if you take a closer look, you'll see how short that PR interval is. Um, some degree of pre-excitation. This patient may have some sort of accessory pathway or pre-excitation. So just things to keep in mind when you're analyzing, um, you know, a 12 lead EKG is you can't necessarily trust what this tells you is a cure restoration. Still wide, complex, and still needed a CRT. Um, and I think he'll benefit very well from it. But things to, uh, to keep in mind, you can't just trust, you know, an automated algorithm to tell you the right thing. Um, so we, here's what we've mentioned. About. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, can I add to um, the 24-year-old? Um, God, um, yeah. So, um, so as AJ was saying, yeah, so the QRS um, pre-device pre, um, implant was about 200 and something. Um, after device implant, we did manage to shrink it down to about 150 after optimi optimizing the device. So um, we have already shrunk um, the, the uh, duration, QRS duration with, with the device, and, and the patient is doing well. Um, he's regularly texting myself and AJ um, about how well he's doing. Um, and his his dressing was taken off, I think, I believe yesterday. And, and is looking good as his wound is looking really, really good. Um, and that's so uh, fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's a really good guy. Good guy. Yeah, great. And hopefully he'll respond really well. He said he's already feeling better. So hopefully, you know, he'll continue. Right. Yes. AJ, can I just add something? Yes, sir. Yeah, good. So uh, the QRS complex post uh, implant from uh, uh, from JOS because he came from JOS. Uh, from JOS, the uh, uh, the ECG uh, is showing that it has shrunken to around uh, one fifty five, one sixty from mm -hmm. two hundred. Then there is another patient from Portacot. Uh, I've I've taken um, uh, express uh, consent from all these patients. That is why I'm mentioning their names. Okay. Uh, not from Port Harcourt, uh, a lady, you remember the second day, that was when we did that case. Uh, mm. Her QRS complex before, uh, before implant was uh, 140. The QRS complex post implant is uh, 114. 
you see how shrunken it comes down. So if you look at the two ECG before and post, it's very clear that mm. it has narrowed significantly. The, uh, when he came for dressing, I sent you the, uh, the, uh, the photo where he was talking about how he was sleeping with four pillows before now. Mm. And uh, after the implant, he can sleep with or without one pillow. So the KRS complex before implant was 188. After the implant, the QRS complex has shrunken down to 130. So these are significant impacts. There's another uh, 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 another patient. Hey, uh, Dr. Gaffey, uh, just because I need to, we're putting this on YouTube, I'm going to edit out all the names and the previous one listed as well. So just if you avoid mentioning the names, make it easier for me to edit later. <laughs> Let me remove the names. So another patient that has a QRS complex of uh, 182 before implant. That was that implant was done on Friday. So 182 before implant and uh, post implant is 128. Mm -hmm. So this fantastic uh, work that was done on this uh, patient. So uh, then uh, the one that had the shock and uh, uh, we have to take that patient back again, which you show the uh, uh, the some of the EKG up. Mm. Uh, that remember the day we were doing that implant. After we finish with the implant, we noticed that the ROV lead has a, had an issue. So we have to change. I think we changed battery, then also change the ROV lead. That was what we did there. Then we move. We now tested again and move the patient out, and we discharge the patient. And only for us to notice that the patient was having VT post implant. And uh, you went and optimized the patient. We took the patient back again to the cat lab and repositioned the ROV lead. And after you left, I will talk more about that patient. But uh, what happened in that patient, when I look at the QRS complex yesterday, it has shrunken from uh, what before implant, it was 170. Now it has come down to around 131, 132. So that is a millisecond. So these are very uh, uh, great numbers when we call them before and post implant. AJ, go ahead. No, that's I, that, that's huge. Uh, you know, it's, it's good to actually hear these, you know, the actual data that from the outcomes of these procedures. I kind of skipped over his slide kind of quickly because I realized that his name was still on it. So I'm gonna cut that out of what's posted on YouTube, even though we have our consents, just because uh, if it's gonna be widely available uh, without letting them know. But I appreciate you bringing that up as far as the outcomes for that patient and um, explaining kind of the, the revising. So yeah, they ended up getting a new device, a new lead and still saw the same issue. Finally, we revised the lead and uh, saw a good outcome. So I think it was a mix between there may have been external noise being detected, and then we had very low sensing amplitude just due to um, could be scar or something in his heart. Um, so we ended up doing the revision and saw good outcomes, good sensing there. Uh, this patient right here uh, was a CRTP. If you can see here, it says RV only down here in the corner. Uh, so this was a CRTP adapted to be a, uh, a BIV. Um, we actually um, implanted them with complete heart block. And then when I went to check them the next day, they had intact conduction. Uh, that does not mean that it's going to continue to be intact, but it's good to see that they do. Uh, they did have some degree of recovery. So uh, one, it's better for the battery. Two, you know, it's always nice not to have dependent patients, but they will have pacing when they do need it um, with less chance of having, you know, pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy. So one thing uh, take away from here is just keep in mind, how do we optimize for the patient? What are the thresholds? Obviously we leave our chronic settings three and a half um, for or our acute settings, three and a half until the leads become more stable. Is a patient dependent at the time they were, but the next day they weren't. So you want to make sure that you have appropriate AV delays to allow intrinsic conduction to come across uh, so in this patient, for example, I just made sure the AV delays were long enough and then activated the VIP algorithm because in the case, we didn't think they'd ever recover and the next day they did. So you want to allow for Abbott devices, they call it VIP for Medtronic devices is called MVP. 
but it's a like a hysteresis or a um, it's an extension of the AV delay program uh, by allowing the intrinsic to come across. So we reduce RV pacing in those cases. Um, and then just to give you some snippets here, just remember to follow industry and manufacturer guidelines. This is an example of one of our Medtronic defibrillators. And obviously, uh, Jules is our Medtronic expert. You could shed more light on this, but the out-of-the-box settings is this AX versus B vector. Medtronic actually wants B to AX moving forward. Uh, this, for people not in the know, is just your... Um, your vector for your defibrillation, but it's something that's really important uh, because there's actually been a, a warning from Medtronic out about it. So um, I think this is part of our concept that we need to have a template um, to guide people who are maybe not as experienced with complex tacky devices and things like that. Um, so that at least you have some sort of guide and then you can customize it to the patient. I don't know if you have any input on that, Jules. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, it is part of the new Medtronic advisory that all the attacky devices, um, the, the shock path should be changed up um, B to AX. Um, so B, that, that's your RV coil, and A is the active can, and X is the SVC. And that's so the shock path all, all have to be aligned that way. Um, and that's so uh, you said it, AJ, so that's right. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so recap the future teams. Uh, we would advise bringing your lead, your scrubs, your shoes. Um, just because it's always good to have, they typically everywhere we went had shoes ready for us, but it's, it's always helpful not to, um, to burden the local uh, teams and everything like that. They have their own stuff to worry about without having to babysit, you know, us coming in. Uh, so it's always nice to bring our own materials if we can, um, extra accessories and implantables. Obviously it's great to have everything on hand. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, you may have to just kind of roll with the punches, so it's it's good to have different things so you can put together different strategies for a patient, uh, bringing meds, as we mentioned before, and then disposables and gowns. Uh, prioritizing resources on hand. So keep in mind that if you're going to be seeing, you know, 15, 20 implants in a week, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're not burning all of your um, long RV leads on patients that could get by with a 52 CM lead, things like that. So being aware before you start this busy week of implants, what you have, so that you don't end up finding yourself uh, shorthanded for the end. Everything worked out for us on this trip, but I could see um, had we not um, been able to acquire additional leads that that Elvis and Dr. Dafe brought in from port -a we could have been in some trouble as far as um, having systems that were well optimized for patients. Um, device selection is key. So just think about, you know, what devices you have for a patient. Um, if you have a patient that is 90 or 91 years old, um, you know, maybe they don't get the longest battery that we have. If we have a younger patient who is going to be, you know, susceptible for more gen changes, generator changes throughout their life, maybe they'll get the newest device. So the, the, the strongest battery, um, just things to keep in mind. Obviously, anytime you have a generator change, you double the risk of infection. So if you have a young patient, things to keep in mind there. Um, finally, maximize time of complex procedures, kind of what we mentioned before. Um, we're, we're always happy to help with dual chambers and ICDs, but these are things that, um, that you know, staff can handle on their own. So it's as we come in for trips, we want to make sure that we're doing the complex procedures. I think that's exactly what we did this trip. We had a ton of CRT, um, way more than, than we could handle at some points. So um, just for future trips as well, if we're going someplace that already knows how to do dual chamber pacemakers, they don't necessarily need us to tell them how to do a, a simple procedure. Um, and it would, you know, far be it for us to uh, to walk in and invade that space just to uh, just to do a pacer. So optimize and maximize our um, our usefulness or our utility when we're there. Uh, finally, we wanted to thank all of our hosts. So Porta Core Cardiology, you know, Dr. Dafe, um, you know, was invaluable in helping us put this together. Um, Cardio Care in Abuja, um, Dr. Seco. You know, his, his facility is fantastic, and we had a great time there. FCC uh, Legos. So, uh, Dr. Johnson, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to meet up, but we really appreciate you hosting us. Dr. Encarno and Dr. Ola Demeji from Lesuth met us out there in Lagos, and we did a number of procedures with them. Uh, and then the Healthy Heart Foundation uh, that is associated with FCC, they work to help supply indigent populations um, with, uh, with devices and supports and help kind of defer the cost. And then obviously, um, pace for life. I have to mention them as well. So pace for life, obviously for, for putting this all together, 
uh, Julius for coming out, Joel for all your hard work you've put into this, uh, you know, Tara, Alicia, who else we had, Dr. Temperley, um, and uh, Stuart, who is, it was great to, to have a, a senior um, Abbott guide as well and kind of bounce our ideas off one another. So it's, it was a really productive trip. As you can see, everyone uh, enjoyed the, the lovely gifts and the food was, uh, was amazing. So I, I probably had way more, um, way more food than I could ever handle. So it was, it was, I had a great time while I was there. Um, here's us in uh, Lagos with Dr. Olmeji, Dr. Seko here doing some work here with the dual chamber pacemaker. I think actually that might've been an ICD with Dr. Templey. And uh, that's, that's the recap. I don't know, is anyone who was with us have anything to add or anything they would like to talk about? Yes, AJ. Yeah, AJ, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. Congratulations for the beautiful time in Nigeria. Uh, what I, the little things I've been adding, but the little things I want to add again is, um, I remember on uh, Wednesday, uh, Ms. Tara uh, took the nurses on uh, the working of the cat lab. So that was a very beautiful time. Ms. Tara taught uh, the nurses of cardio care on the working of the cat lab. Then also, um, <clears throat> The flight with local flights that we also took in Nigeria, they are well organized and uh, we must appreciate them, especially when the flight lands, we want to come out uh, is row by row. You don't just rush. Uh, I think uh, Julius really appreciate us for the discipline that we have in Nigeria on the issue of local flights. Then the hotels where we stay, uh, the staffs were very good. I remember the first day uh, you lost your uh, your wallet, and uh, <laughs> you gotta come to me like this, okay? And I said, AJ, I have never lost anything here. Let's go and look for that wallet, and we look for it. Uh, Gino swim. You went to the gym, and uh, you have some gym and uh, some phones. Uh, um, Istara, uh, Alicia, I think they went to uh, they went to the park to see some of the animals, some supermarkets, and the rest of them. In fact, a couple of things to mention. The teams have been so wonderful. Um, simply uh, very extraordinary. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Steward. Uh, and the rest of the team, everybody very wonderful. In fact, we are missing you guys here in Nigeria. So a great time and a great time. Then the other one I want to talk about is the issue of um, that patient that we took back to the cat lab uh, the second time. So after uh, the, uh, the team, the mission ended, uh, you know, there was no mortality throughout the mission. It must be commended and appreciated. There was no mortality on the, uh, among the patients we work on, and there was no conversion because the mission is uh, mainly on CRT. There was no conversion of uh, CRT because of fail, uh, fail every lead position. So after we took that patient back again to the cat lab, the patient returned back, uh, and the mission ended, we, the, we started having uh, the patients, sorry, the patients started having a lot of VT and the device was actually shocking. I thought uh, Dr. Seko would be here to uh, mention something, but I messaged him, seemed that he's busy. So what we did, the fantastic team of cardio care, what the fantastic team did was um, we all teamed together, uh, myself, Dr. Seko, um, uh, Dr. Wolfie, so we all team together and uh, we have to uh, put this patient on, um, uh, on lidocaine. So after multiple shock, the lidocaine was able to convert this patient. The reason being that one, that patient had a uh, heart STEMI that was October 2022 uh, and he had no coronary angio because there were no funds uh, you can't even pay for, uh, for the use of the cat lab, even though when the procedure is free. So what we did for him is that we gave him a lidocaine and uh, 
as at we are speaking today, he's out of the VT. The myocardium is now quiet and um, he's recovering and uh, he's doing very well. So he's the only patient that remain in the hospital as we are speaking. Every other patient has been discharged and all their wounds have healed. Even his own wound has also healed. The reason why we are still keeping him is that we want to observe and keep observing and seeing what the uh, what the uh, the uh, the lidocaine effect is. Because after the lidocaine terminated the VT, we noticed that he had post uh, post VT uh, uh, sorry post lidocaine complication uh, uh, post uh, medication complications. That was what we noticed in him. So we are still keeping him in the hospital not because he had a VT again, his BP has come up. Before now, his BP went down, he went into cardiogenic shock. He went into cardiogenic shock and he was having a BP of around uh, uh, 70, systolic 70, diastolic uh, 30, 40, for almost uh, two days. Even despite, uh, despite all our, uh, our medication to optimize the BP. Um, and today the BP has stabilized, everything has normalized, and his wound has also healed. Uh, but we are now watching for uh, the side effect of nidocaine to wane out before we pull him, before we discharge him from the hospital. So great job to CardioCare and the team uh, of um, uh, Pace for Life for all the good job that you have done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Duffin. Thank you for mentioning uh, Tara and Alicia as well. I, I completely, I'm sorry to leave you out of that, that, that we couldn't, with the day we were in Lagos, the fantastic work you did training <laughs> in Abuja, so. Um, yeah, I was just gonna add actually, AJ, from a nursing perspective, um, a lot, uh, some of the nurses sort of expressed an interest to become cath lab nurses. Uh, they're very interested in how the lab works, how it runs, how they can become um, cath lab nurses and scrub. Um, so I will be sending them uh, a lot of information. We use uh, sort of competences, training competences for recovery and the cath lab. So I'm going to be sending them over. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to utilize them and you know sort of be able to make up their own program, so to speak. Um, I don't know how going forward, because obviously, when we do it, we learn on the job. But if there's nobody there um, to teach them, that's slightly difficult. Um, so that may be something to look at in the future. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I think that, you know, having repeated trips, having a good cadence of, of these trips can help keep that information fresh in their mind, obviously, as well. So I think that yeah. uh, obviously... Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to go again. It was, it was a brilliant experience. We were looked after very well. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was very, very good experience. I, I think my only regret is that Julius never learned how to swim, unfortunately. So, Doctor, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I, I showed I showed it on a video that I was I wasn't too bad. That wasn't that. It's not proof enough for Adafi. He needs to he needs to further <laughs> evaluate. I, I'll take him on any day. We'll see him soon. We'll see him soon. I will. Yeah, I, I think I muted you, by the way, Dr. Daffe, because there was a little bit of a background. Uh, was there anybody else? <laughs> there there I've never seen Julius and had to swim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about that. To see. Julius, you know that I'm from the uh, riverized part of Nigeria. I'm I from Bayas, who grew up in the water. So I, I would teach him on how to swim. I right. really. <laughs> Then the um, other point we should also mention is uh, I remember talking with uh, Dr. Timpley that we have a lot of uh, variation in our anatomy. Uh, you know, sometimes when we when we go for the for the ID site, we notice that the 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 vein is not actually on that ID site. So uh, AJ, uh, Dr. Timpley has also agreed that. Yes, that we had a lot of, uh, we have significant variation. I would say a lot, but we have significant variations in our anatomy. 
So one of the things we also learned in this mission is that when you punctures at the first rib and you are not getting it, this uh, do an uh, do an angiogram. And uh, you may be shocked that uh, the second rib may be the ideal point for you to take your, your puncture. So, but all the same, uh, we teach Julius and Adrian how to swim in the sure. next time. <laughs> hey, any time, Dr. Daffy, any time. Dr. Daffy, can you correct me if I'm wrong? So for any future missions, do you think you benefit from maybe having, having a, a temporary pacing wire kit? like a complete set, because we came across a few patients in, in Kohaku who were really dependent, who might be sort of nearing battery, battery change at some point. Yes. You remember there was a patient with who interrogated for Tarkot, who yeah. his battery is less than one year, and yeah. uh, within the next three months, we are going to change it. That, that patient will require uh, a temporary pacemaker to do that because yeah. it's totally dependent on the yeah. device. Yeah. So we can't have the kind of split without uh, pacing ongoing. Very important, yeah. very important. Excellent. And and can I add, I know everybody's been thanked, but can I also say um, a special thank you to Alicia as well for sending all the video diaries. They were absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Well appreciated for keeping people back in the UK, in America, across the world, um, abreast of all the things that were going on. Um, yeah. You even had your own kind of style to it, which is like you know, your your favorite Nigerian um, like musicians, uh, Afrobeats, and, and that just added a kind of a, a little sort of taster to the whole video diary. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> The nicest thing you've said to me, Julia. Oh, I'm always nice to you. Always. Well, at least this is recorded. <laughs> yeah, we're through. Very good. Uh, yeah, thanks, AJ, for, for doing this. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, AJ, thank you very much. You are a fantastic guy. Julius is now our ECG rabbi. A very yes. great guy in ECG. If Julius, if you have any ECG problem, Send it to Julius, send it to the group so that Julius teaches us ECG. He's a great ECG rabbi of our time. So we really appreciate you for your insights, extraordinary insight into ECG. Uh, it's a phenomenal. Thank you very much for that. I, Thank I, you. I appreciate that, but I completely disagree. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Looks like, uh, really quick, sorry to jump in. Uh, looks like we have a hand raised. Uh, someone named Samsung SM, which I don't think maybe is their real name. Uh, we have a question from the group. Um, good evening. I am James Russell from Sierra Leone, an associate professor of medicine, and I'm currently the dean of uh, clinical sciences. I joined uh, recently uh, this group hoping that the timeline that was given was within the time frame that I was supposed to join. Unfortunately, in West Africa, we have variants in terms of our timeline. Um, having said that, I was introduced by a Sierra Leonean whose name basically I cannot remember um, about the Peace for Life um, project, which is currently ongoing in um, Cameroon and Nigeria. So they asked me to join because we are doing similar projects with My Heart, Your Heart uh, Foundation in the US. And I've been working um, with Professor Zaid Yusuf from um, Cardiff University. Um, I don't know whether this meeting is about um, pacemaker related issues. I can see one of my Oga, my big boys, my big boss, Dr. Oga, is also um, on this meeting. Thank you, and over to you. Sorry, are you? Um, sorry, are you James Russell? Or... Yes, I am James Russell. I'm so James that, Russell. So that was me that sent you the invite to come on this, to come and watch this. Okay, you, yes. Joel. Oh. Yeah. So my name is. Yeah. Julia. I spoke to Joel about you, and and and. Yeah. We, Basically, I mean, I'll let Joel speak more about it. He will tell you more about it. But, um, yeah, sorry, Joel. 
Yeah, just to say it's great to, to talk to you in person. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Yusuf in Cardiff and he told me about the programme in Sierra Leone and we work very closely with My Heart, Your Heart. I've just been out to visit them about three weeks ago, Thomas Crawford, Eric Burrell and Brad. And uh, yeah, we'd love to continue to help you. So, so perhaps we should set up a Zoom call all together uh, with Julius, AJ and everybody and also with Thomas and Eric and uh, have a really great call about how we can help you in Sierra Leone. I know they've been out before. And so, yeah, let's have a call at some stage. Um, and just as a as a straight first question, how, how would you like us to help you going forward? Would you like more devices? Would you like some people to come out, like a mission like this? How can we help you? Oh, well, um, that's a very good question because I've been doing quite a lot of pacemaker um, implantation as a cardiologist. And apparently we've had a good number. I'm currently doing uh, um, a study with um, um, Eric as well as um, Dr. Um, this chap from Michigan University. Um, his name, his name is completely, so the line is bad. Hello. My line, the, the line. Yeah, yeah I think that, Dr. Daffy, I think there's a lot of noise on your end. Yes. There, there, are, there are lots of interference. I don't know whether the, the, the network is from my own part. So rightly being mentioned, of course, yes, we do have quite a lot of um, new as well as um, reused uh, devices. And we have been doing quite a lot. But this is a, a discussion that we can have outside this meeting, especially in terms of um, helping out with devices, because from our end, a significant proportion of the patient definitely cannot afford to buy or to pay for the devices. So um, I welcome any suggestion, any um, questions or discussion that we might have in order to push the project here in Sierra Leone. Thank you and over to you. Well, perhaps first I can make the suggestion that AJ Hale, who is on the call here, is shortly to be full time for pacemaker reconditioning and reprocessing across Africa. So maybe I can ask AJ to set up a call with you, if that's OK. And, um, and who, who has your that, number that, of details? That's perfectly OK. Yeah. Do, do we have your that's, details? Yeah, I think Julius. I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. Perfect. Great. So maybe AJ and Julius, if you set up a call with uh, with him and uh, and we'll, we'll invite uh, Eric and Thomas and yeah, we'll have a full call about exactly how we can help again, because I know they've been there, especially before lockdown. Um, Eric and Thomas were there. So let's let's get going to help you out as much as we can. We've even got funding no. for a mission. So, you know, we can send people out exactly like this mission. We can do advanced devices. We can get you the iPad. We can get you defibrillators. We've got unlimited access to reconditioned pacemakers. Oh, that'll so be fine because, be, 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 yeah, that'll be fine. I'm looking forward towards um, the discussion related to how best you can help from your end. Fantastic. I will, uh, Julius and I will circle back, put everybody into a, to an email chain and we'll, we'll get to work on that. So thanks for joining. Wonderful. Um, Elvis, I see your hand raised. Did you have anything before we uh, hop off the call? Yeah. Good day, everyone. Hi, AJ. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I just want to say, um, express my gratitude to Face for Life for this um, opportunity. It's um, it's been really a blessing to Nigeria and to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa for the exchange of um, sharing of knowledge, experience, as well as um, tools to work with. Because um, you can read all the books you want to read. Uh, if you don't have the tools to work with, it's just an academic exercise. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And as a physiologist, I appreciate uh, the, the learning that... Uh, a peaceful life has really helped us to. I, I'm speaking for other colleagues too. Uh, has really helped us to to move on in our fields and to gain more experience. Thanks um, to everyone. It was really nice having you around. Thank you, AJ. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elvis. I I really appreciate it. And yeah, it was it was fantastic to be there. And we we appreciate all the support on your end as well. It looks like uh, Paisley. Uh, oh, we had thank you. 
Yes, hi, just a quick one for me. I'm going out with Paish um, in October to Nigeria. And I just wondered if it might be useful for um, myself and the other physiologist that's going out, Phil, to have a chat with yourself um, about stock that we need to get out there. Um, just so that we, because we were hoping to kind of, well, we haven't really thought of that from far through, but we're hoping to go up to the back cave and see what there's there and get um, all the stock set out ahead of time so it can pre-clear customs and get it there before we get there. Um, and just kind of from what you've said, um, there's bits that I wouldn't have even thought of about taking up. So I thought it might be quite useful if we can have a chat about that and see what things we should definitely be getting. Sure. Up there. EJ, can, I, I, can, I, can I answer this? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so, um, yes, I spoke to Dr. Patel about this. He, he, he called me. Um, so the, the person who was in, char in charge of the logistics um, in terms of all the, all the items that we were taking um, to Nigeria was actually Stuart. He wasn't he wasn't able to come on today. So Dr. Patel was was going to be calling Stuart later on um, to actually discuss this with him because he's been to um, Joel's back cave. And, oh, okay. <laughs> and had a look. Um, so he he knows exactly all the stuff that you, you would need to take and and where we fell short as well, like AJ spoke about um, earlier on. So um, I think Dr. Patel is already going to be dealing with that um, with Stuart. So he's kind of delegated it to me, I think, because he had a lot going oh, on. Right. So he's asked me yeah. to try and sort it. Yeah, me mm -hmm. and Phil, so the two physiologists sure. go in. So yeah. John, so, give, oh, sorry, go on. Oh no, I would just say we could we can put together a call with maybe all of us together then. Sure. Uh, Jules, if you're available, and then obviously Stuart. Um Paisley, uh, I'll just reach off. I don't know. Does anyone have your contact information? Don't feel free not I'm to. I'm on the it. WhatsApp group if that helps. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll be there. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll we'll reach out to you directly then and we can uh go from there. Perfect. Perfect. The only other thing to say, Paisley, is that um the last uh sending of a box to uh Emmanuel and Michael took quite a long time to to get there so often it takes a couple of weeks but there was a bit of a strike so so it took two months to get them out there so that so might be that we sort of you know let's not, not delay too much once you've had a chat with Stuart once we have a chat and, and then Michael Ollie Mage is on the call here today once we've got a good idea of the sort of things uh, we have loads of PSA cables, we have a wide range of leads, we have, uh, you know, a lot of things that have just been mentioned, so we can get a whole load in a box, but let's, let's, let's try and see if we can do it maybe 10, 10 weeks before you go out, just so it, uh, it safely gets there. Okay. Also, maybe as a question to AJ and Julius, would you say you probably had plenty of luggage space, um, and did you have any problems taking stuff out in your luggage? Right. Um, yeah, I would say sometimes carrying over, sorry, Jules, I interrupted you, but sometimes carrying over is, is easier um, in some way. I think most of what we used actually came out of bags we carried. Um, rather than we set ahead. Spot. Yes, spot on. Spot on, yeah. Um, and how did you manage to take leads out? Did you take, because that's a lot of weight to take. Yeah. So, so a Paisley, so each lead roughly weighs on about seven kilograms. So yeah. every, everybody took their own lead coats. But what it was, I got stopped twice when we we're flying back into the UK. It wasn't going out to Nigeria. Okay. Uh, and I had to explain what this thing is. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so I was called, we've, we've gone through um, checking everything. Everything's all done, security. We're just going to relax, start drinking coffee. Then I yeah. hear me being mentioned on the tannoy, like, you know, Julius Donko, come right there. So I went all the way down, <laughs> almost almost to the, where the airplane was, you know, where they were sorting out the luggages. And, and I had about 10 people surrounding me, like asking me, what is this thing? Yeah, and I had to explain to them. And they said that we've had about three, three boxes, like three luggages going with lead coats in them. And they were all flagging up, but we often let, Three go and the fourth one we had to really find out what it is so i yeah. was called out to explain to them and they said thank you very much so next time you come we will know and i told them that there is going to be this is going to be repeated um from from the uk yeah. so i think i think they are maybe a little bit wiser about it now so so that should so they, they should know about it now okay they should know about it and the other thing also um with regards to um these of donation letter which we normally get and um, from my heart, your heart, a repeal normally sends it. I think I spoke to um, Dr. Patel about this. 
Um, so we had Eric print out a digital donation just to say to Nigerian customs that we're carrying all these goods, like devices and yeah. whatnot. Because they get they get alarmed. They're like, they're like, what, what is this? What's going on? What's this? Um when we went, when we went there this time, nothing. Surprisingly, it was absolutely nothing. Okay. <laughs> nothing. But when I went there last year, oh my word, I had to read a nightmare. Myself. Yeah, it was a nightmare. <laughs> so you never know who you're gonna get basically and but be prepared you know we can always get eric to write you a diesel donation letter and yeah that's what we thought we'd try and get as much shipped out ahead of time as we could um mm -hmm. but but things like yeah those little bits we might have to get make sure we've got all the stuff in place for that yeah on. yeah spot on. yeah we've got yeah, an no open invite to come up thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> I I would just get uh, copies of the letter, put one in every suitcase you have, just so when they inspect it, they know what, what to look for there. Um, and who do we get fine. that letter off? Is that from? Well, my hat, your hat, Eric Peel. Yeah, the World Medical Relief is actually who, the one who printed it out for us. Uh, George, okay. Nathan, I want to say his name. We'll, we'll get you in touch with him to get a. Oh, perfect. Thank that's you. That's through My Heart, Your Heart and World Medical Relief to get the, the letter there. Um, okay. And you can also ask Michael Adizmeji to do a form letter of invitation. Uh, which we need that anyway also, for our visa, I think. Yeah, so put that in with your stuff, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and get so, visas early as well. I was yeah. going to ask about visas as well. How was right. that process? So so I was, <laughs> again, I was going to speak to Dr. Patel about this. In fact, after this, he, he went off. The reason being, so I've been in touch with Dr. Johnson, Yemi Johnson, and I think there's going to be something done. So I've asked him to um, get all your names. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to forward it to him. I think he's actually going to meet a very important person tomorrow. And, and he's asked for the names. Um, so I don't know what's going to be ha happening, but um, he's going to tell us exactly how we need to apply for it. Um, just so that we can circumvent the, the issues that we had. Okay. Know, our mission. Um, so he's going to find out exactly what's needed, how we need to um, apply you know, for it and, and, and what's what. And that so um, so I, I I try and obviously I'll let Dr Patel let you know or I'll ask can you drop your phone number for me, easily? Yeah, I can. Do you want me to put it in the chat on here? Um, oh, you can make it private. Yeah. Uh, yeah, make it private. Her. She's in the WhatsApp group. Uh, Dr. Yeah, on the WhatsApp. Her phone number's on the WhatsApp. Oh, she's yeah. in the WhatsApp. Okay, let me let me yeah. get it. Let me get it just now. Yeah, uh, Doctor Oliver Measure, you had something. Okay. Um, once again, I want to appreciate the um, Peace for Life group for the generous help they've given us in Nigeria. Um, so regarding um, the questions raised regarding for, for the upcoming um, missions, so we can provide all necessary official documents that would um, facilitate your traveling across customs and across um, our NDLA, which is the FDA of um, UK or US. So we have um, an official backing from, because we are Lagos State Teaching Hospital, so we are a government um, institution. So um, whatever um, documents you need to cross the customs or any officials at the airport, we have the backing of the government to give you all the necessary documents. So you just let us know and we will address it to, we will be willing and very ready to do that. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, um, if I don't see any other hands raised, if anyone has anything else, let us know. But thank you again to all of our friends in Nigeria for hosting us. It was a fantastic time and we definitely uh, are excited to get back there and and uh, get some work done. So appreciate yeah, when's it. When's your next? When are you going back next then? <laughs> Who, me? I don't know. October. When we go back to Emmanuel? We'll have to start planning, won't we? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Great, great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, AJ. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. God bless you. Bye, you. Elvis. Bye, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good to have you.